A while back, we were contacted by one of our viewers, a scientist who'd just bought a pair of Volvo C40 rechargers, one for him and one for his mum. And having road tripped across the country, he arrived back home in Chicago's south side and realised that, unlike many urban areas, where he lived was essentially devoid of modern rapid charging infrastructure. He told us that he'd reached out to Electrify America and was, shall we say, disappointed in the response. And he, like many of you, wondered how charging networks decide where chargers should go and how their networks should grow. So we sat down with folks from a variety of networks to find out how that all works and what they are doing to improve access to charging. Back when EVs were first considered a great choice for road tripping, by which I mean back in the Victorian era, there really wasn't a charging network as such. It was just that electrification was more reliably available than gasoline. And you might find the local druggist or hardware store was flat out of that newfangled petroleum distillate. But someone in town would probably have power for something. But realistically, most people, other than taxi drivers who also mainly drove electric incidentally, they would do their charging at home. Then in the 1960s with the advent of my favourite car that I have never driven, the Mars 2, its manufacturer built out the first electric car expressway with a network of 50 kilowatt rapid charging stations roughly every 50 miles stretching between Detroit and Chicago. That network supported its fleet of development vehicles as well as those sold to consumers. Although with ranges reportedly extending up to over 200 miles for some of those 60s and 70s models, the network was most likely really for publicity. Because again, most folks charged at home. And that's a pattern that we've seen play out with modern EVs. Statistically, more than 80% of charging is done at home, so why does public charging even matter? Well, as we move towards greater adoption, we are seeing more and more folks consider an EV. And in the US, where roughly half of the US population of existing car owners don't have access to private off-street parking or charging, and only 37% of renters has access to a garage or a carport, the availability of public and rapid charging is vital to the expansion of EV adoption. Back in 2018, the International Council on Clean Transportation examined how network infrastructure had been planned and found out that various predictions and models used by different network providers led to different answers as to how many charges were needed to support electrification of public transportation. And because each network has taken its own models and its own approach to planning those networks out, each network has its own answer as to how and where it should put chargers. At EVgo, we select our charging sites in a fairly sophisticated way. We have a team of uh, analysts that have spent their entire careers planning out networks. And we've created a network plan that's based on a lot of different factors. They're broadly in two different categories. Uh, supply and demand side uh, factors. On the demand side, we track vehicle registrations uh, in census blocks all around the country. Uh, and in addition, we track forecasts from uh, commercially available sources or from OEM partners on where we think vehicles are gonna be sold. Uh, on the supply side, we need to worry about economic factors. So there we are uh, tracking rates that will be charged by utilities and all the construction costs of the sites. So charging locations are chosen in two primary ways. First is really understanding the interest and commitment of the site host. And the second is through a variety of analytics. So if we think of the first piece, the interest and the commitment of the site host, there's really a variety of, of different movers that we're seeing in this space today. Freewire primarily serves retail and fleet customers in both public and private settings. And we find that our customers are motivated by a variety of different factors. It could be that they want to attract new drivers to their site. 
They want to diversify their revenue. Maybe they want to enhance their brand. Perhaps there's regulatory requirements that are pushing them to electrify. Or maybe it's they just want to establish a competitive advantage. And so when we look uh, across the retail and fleet sectors, we see first movers, fast followers, and those that just want to wait and see. So in looking for locations, that's the first thing we're trying to understand. And then the the second part of it comes uh, to the analytics. And increasingly, there's more and more analytics that we can tap into and look at when we're helping our customers evaluate locations. And so a few of these include proximity to other charging stations. Maybe the site already has charging on-site lower lower power charging. They want to replace it with new equipment or higher power equipment. Um, we look at whether the site is along a travel corridor or in a community. And then we get into some variables having to do with, you know, the expected number of, of sessions that we could project per day, the available funding opportunities, and then other costs that may impact um, that particular location's viability for charging, such as energy costs, operational costs, and maintenance costs. There is this big chicken and the egg problem, a problem we still face a little bit today, where what comes first, the ability to charge or the, the existence of an EV to make that charging model attractive. And so it actually started in Hawaii. Our first stations at Volta were in Hawaii. And what we did is we came up with an idea that if you have um, a, a media station that has advertising at places that people see it, that can provide the revenue that you need while putting in a charger to encourage people to adopt EVs and everything else. So that simple idea has kind of turned into where we are today. The media revenue is a big component when we're looking at the X's and O's of whether a station is an, a good investment. You know, if, all, if you need to have revenue from just charging, you have to be very picky about where you're putting chargers. You have to put them at places where EVs already exist. Well, we, we didn't want that constraint. We wanted to be able to accelerate adoption of EVs. So when you put the media station there, and they're big, beautiful 55-inch screens, front and center in parking lots usually, you know, the ability to generate revenue there has allowed us to be more aggressive in where we go. So we can go into neighborhoods that don't have a lot of EVs yet. We can go into places that really you know, have been ignored by the rest of the charging community because we have a different model. And so that's been really great. It's allowed us to work with um, a lot of the big types of grocery and shopping retail centers who really want to say, I want charging at all of my stations. And we can go back to them and say, we can do this at all of your places. It doesn't matter if there are EVs in your community yet. So that's really allowed us to be a company that can kind of go into neighborhoods, whether they have high EV adoption or not, and put charging in, into the world and you know, really get that wave of adoption going. It's, it's actually quite surprising um, how simplistic they started. So if you look even just a few years ago, maybe three to four years ago, most of the way that charging locations were chosen was really just where are the EVs? Where are the electric vehicles? And where are generally you know, strong transportation hubs, meaning lots of traffic? And so one of the things we have to remember is that the charging networks are trying to optimize not just for utilization of their assets, but for um, R R R ROI of that asset. And they're not necessarily the same. If you have really good utilization of your charger, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll make a lot of money on that charger. A lot of networks sort of put charging stations where intuitively it seemed best to put them. They found that the performance was quite lacking. And then they all started to put in a next generation of analysis, data analysis and things like that to help guide this a little bit better. And the reason is because so many of those charging stations are utilized on average around 5% of the day of a 24 hour period they're being used. Which is, which is not very good. So that's why we're starting to see this. And I think in the early days, they weren't as ROI focused as they were just getting charging stations out there as fast as possible. And so maybe getting back to the original question, how are locations chosen? I think it's shifted. Initially it was intuition and where is it fastest to build? Meaning permits are easy, construction is easy and cheap and we have parking there and it's straightforward. I think now it's shifting into a much more data-driven analytical approach, just like you would expect to see in, 
you know, a Starbucks or McDonald's organization that's trying to make sure that these are placed in really strong locations. Now, it might be that you really want to put EV charging somewhere, but you can't because dot, dot, dot. Often, at the moment, EV chargers are placed at large groceries or are outside other large chains. We're not going to get into the whole discussion of food deserts right now, but the existence of food deserts means that there may not be a grocery store or other large chain to place them at. So that leaves us with the question of what does make a good charging location? First and foremost, it, it all comes down to the return on investment. But when you get down to the site location specifically, we look at uh, first and foremost, we're looking at amenities. So, you know, what are the amenities on site that may be provided for a driver to, to utilize um, bathrooms, food options, things of that nature. Increasingly, we're seeing a lot of our customers, you know, integrate charging equipment into their their loyalty programs or their port and sale programs. So again, the, the, a lot of our customers are thinking about this holistically, you know, how can they attract the, those that are showing up and charging into the, the other aspects of, of what's offered on site. Um, we're also looking at space. Space is a big issue, especially for a lot of the fuelers that we, we work with and the, the retail entities. Um, parking's a premium. So really understanding how many parking spaces would need to be committed to a charging station is, is really important. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, utilization and location is key. Uh, safety, uh, lighting, signage, all, all critical pieces to um, identify where, where they might fit into to establishing a good site. So factors that can make site selection more challenging or or factors that can create more challenging sites would be space availability, power availability, energy costs, the amount of time it may take to, to permit a project or bring in additional power or electrical infrastructure to support EV charging. So free, free wires model is unique in that we integrate battery storage technology and EV charging equipment together. We have a battery integrated charging unit. It's a direct current fast charging unit. And the benefit of this configuration is that we're able to provide fast, reliable charging to drivers while minimizing the impact um, to the grid. So we have a low input power draw from the grid to recharge our battery pack and then provide the high output power for charging vehicles. As a result of this configuration, we're, we're frequently able to avoid some of the electrical infrastructure that's typically required to support fast charging uh, stations. And we're also able to, to mitigate some of the energy costs that can, can often undermine the economic viability of, of owning and operating stations. So there are many aspects of a site that can make or break it as in terms of viability. Uh, some of the things that you wouldn't really think too much about are whether or not there are trees overhead or storm drains down below. Uh, the slope, the grading of a site can be problematic. Uh, the site hosts might actually have seasonal uh, events that they have in their parking lots that would disqualify a site. There are many different things actually that can uh, either support uh, deployment in a site or effectively cancel it. Uh, so, so a charging station costs about $100,000 for one uh, DC fast charger. I know it can be a little bit more, a little bit less depending on the speed. Um, you wanna put maybe four to 10 at a given location. So you're talking 400,000 to a million dollars. And now that's getting to the cost of putting a full-fledged Starbucks or McDonald's at a location. And so, of course, the number one question is how many patrons are going to show up at this location and how much energy are they going to pull? And also, what time are they going to show up? Because depending on when they show up, the cost of the energy to me as a charging network will be different. And that's a lot of unknowns. How are you supposed to predict how many people are going to show up at your Starbucks, let alone how many people are going to show up at your EV charging station, especially because the number of EVs on the road is changing so much every day? 
It's actually an incredibly hard question because there's so much growth and change in the space right now. If you're trying to figure out how well utilized the station's gonna be, whether people are gonna like it, you have to make some predictions about what the future looks like. So we try and mitigate that by work, you know, working to put our stations in places that we know people love to go, but that can only get you so far. So actually over the course of time, we've had to come up with a tool. It's a pretty smart tool, it's called Predictive. We basically take all these data sets, some of them are public, some of them are privately procured, and we integrate it into a forecasting tool. We use it ourselves. So my team is the team that kind of designs the sites and builds them. Um, we rely heavily on the output of this predictive tool to take all this data, figure out where people um, are coming from, and make sure that we're serving the community that we think we're serving, um, and can be comfortable in the utilization that we're gonna get in the future. And we actually make decisions on how big a station should be, whether we should go there at all. Um, so that tool has proven to be incredibly important for us to make good decisions. We're actually finding that plenty of our partners find the tool useful as well. So that same tool has been adapted. Utilities want to use that tool. We're finding really good partnerships with local governments who are saying, I know EVs are coming, but I don't know how. Help me understand my own city. So with the fundamental features of a good site identified, you've got power and you've got some shelter. Well, no, I'm hearing we can't have shelter, but at least you have 24 hour facilities nearby to help out customers with mobility ish. No, no, OK, scratch that. OK, so you've got your place where there is power available for the chargers that you want to install. The planning issues have all been resolved, and there's the question of who's going to use those chargers. So how does EV ownership, projected and current, factor into those decisions? So at EVGO, we, uh, we balance the existing ownership versus projected ownership by having a very sophisticated network plan. That plan allows us to algorithmically decide where the best locations are for sites. And there, we spread them across metro areas to make sure that we're getting broad coverage. But then also, we, we go for higher uh, stall counts in sites where we know that there is concentrated demand. So EV ownership and, and usage and utilization of charging is a huge variable in identifying uh, sites that will be successful for charging infrastructure, much, much more so than even a few years ago. Uh, at FreeWire, we acquired a company last year called Mobilize AI, and this platform is, um, is, is a modeling platform that takes into account uh, vehicle registration, traffic volume, site visitor patterns, and historical charging data. and and through the modeling and through the platform, we can get down to a granular level and help the, the site host predict what level of charging utilization they can anticipate over the near term, medium term, and long term. So there's an increasingly uh, important role for this type of data in analyzing and assessing the viability of, of different locations. Yeah, this is one of those surprising facts. Um... So again, put your, put your you know, investor hat on and imagine that you are running a charging network and you're about to spend a million dollars on one location. Um, and so of course you would say, okay, if there's lots of electric vehicles here, I should have a big customer base to serve with my fast charging station. But it actually isn't true, um, not necessarily at least. What, what actually matters more than that maybe, well, how, how far are each one of those EVs driving per day? They're only driving five miles a day, then they don't need a charge <laughs> here, um, especially a fast charge. If, if they have charging at home, then they might not need a charge here either. So it's a combination of factors that actually can influence the, the usage rate of a charging station. And then of course, all of that's gonna change next year when there are a lot more EVs on the road and people of different income brackets are now buying EVs that are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Now, what are their behaviors gonna be? So you're left with this like conundrum of trying to predict the future of not only technology improvements like battery size and charging speeds, but also adoption rates of EVs and also behavior changes of how you might drive an EV. 
And so it's, it's, and one funny, interesting fact is that the other tactic that we've seen out there is, okay, let's use traffic data. And there's lots of different data providers out there that tell you about traffic, traffic counters or traffic data. How many vehicles are driving by the site, electric or none, any, any traffic by the site. And I would expect that if most of the traffic is driving by the site at 3 PM, then most of my charging station usage at 3 PM will happen at 3 PM. And that's not so good because at 3 PM, the cost of electricity to me is higher. Um, what we found empirically in the evidence, and, and we do this because we can benchmark it against real utilization rates of charging stations all around the country, is that traffic is not highly correlated with utilization rate. Meaning that if just because you see a lot of traffic showing up near your site around, you know, on the roads near your site around 3 p.m., it does not mean that most of your charging stations usage will happen at 3 p.m. In fact, it could not mean it at all. And so that again points to the fact that behaviors are different. You know, people aren't charging necessarily when they're driving on that commute time, it might be later in the evening, for example, where they're at a destination and they're doing something else while they're charging. So when we talk about projected ownership, to be honest, that's exactly the, the problem that Stable solves. The way we do it is we provide software that they can use to estimate how, many, how much utilization a new site will get based on 75 different things, all the typical stuff you would think, traffic, EV penetration rates, utilization rates of other chargers, competition nearby, the amenities near that site. And we've done that because we've been able to learn from our data what that looks like. And then when we talk about projections of how do we project EV ownership down the road, to be honest, your guess is as good as mine. How do we know? And everybody has a projection. McKinsey, Deloitte, Goldman Sachs, you know, EIA, everyone comes out every year, Bloomberg, with their EV penetration forecast for the next 10 years. And they're all wrong. <laughs> And they're going to be wrong. And so what people do in our software actually is you, you can model you know, a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. And you look at the spread and you say, okay, if in the best case, most optimistic EV adoption scenario, this site will not pay back in its 10 year lifetime of that charger, we should not go forward with this site, obviously, right? So that's a little bit of, it's, it's honestly, there's a little bit of data science and, and that's what we provide. We provide that baseline prediction but then in projecting out the future, that comes to your certainty, your risk tolerance, how conservative you wanna be, how bearish or bullish you are on EVs. And there's a little bit of intuition built into that projection uh, because we don't know the future. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's two things. You know, maybe for some reason, the data says this should be a highly, you know, you know, have a lot of EVs adopted in the space, but it hasn't yet for some reason, so you can feel good about it in the future. Um, but even if you know that the adoption is not coming until a year or two, instead of waiting for a year or two, we can say, well, we can put our stations in now and actually help accelerate that. So the data tells us what we can expect and our model helps us be even more aggressive on top of that data. As we've heard, many networks have historically been reliant on either existing or predicted EV sales in an area to decide profitability of a station. Slightly different in Tesla's case where the network rollout is funded by vehicle sales. So there's a drive there to ensure that existing owners are well supported and not so much to get new owners. As a result, EV network rollout has been patchy and with predictions of technology uptake notoriously unreliable, you only have to look at solar generation capacity to see a really great example of that. We've ended up in a place where because each network applied its own metrics and own network planning algorithms, the end result has been, well, should we say it's been uneven? And we've spoken before on this channel about a long history of programming inequality into algorithms because people writing software often end up coding their own biases and assumptions into the algorithms that they're writing. The end result of this is that Axios published an article this year that pointed out that over 1.4 times as many charges were located in majority white areas of housing as were located in majority non-white regions. Our own examination of the five most segregated cities showed an even more stark division, with rapid charging provision almost entirely absent from regions that have historically been subject to redlining. Redlining was legally enshrined discrimination against neighbourhoods with predominantly black residents. Unlike predominantly white neighbourhoods where cheap mortgages were available, redlined districts weren't eligible for those mortgages, or indeed often for any mortgages, 
making it vastly harder for those families to own their own homes or live in those areas. And as a result, it prevented them from building generational wealth. While technically outlawed in 1968 and theoretically barred from occurring in the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act, it's consistently been shown that black and minority areas continue to be discriminated against and that often areas that were historically redlined remain majority minority even today. These majority minority areas often remain subject to lower investment. And looking at the five most segregated cities in the US, cities that really clearly show this history having an impact on the way people live today, it's really clear. Areas that are majority minority which were often subject to redlining are now areas in which there's a real dearth of charging opportunities. That means that it's harder to live with an EV in those areas and that as we see rapid charges helping to make places an appealing destination, those areas might again miss out on another round of investment and consumer spending. Now, some will no doubt say that predictions of ownership of a type of vehicle that has, historically at least, been more expensive than the average new or used vehicle would most likely disproportionately fall in areas with higher incomes and therefore that historically disinvested areas might be slower to obtain those vehicles. But at this point, we're reaching a chicken and egg situation where if there isn't charging available either at work or at home or somewhere convenient and cheap, then EVs can't reasonably be purchased by folks in these areas. And what you end up with is a significant impediment to EV adoption for huge swathes of the country, particularly in cities where shared parking or multifamily dwellings make installation of home charging infrastructure more difficult. And where even in single family dwellings, lax state rules have allowed rentier landlords to bar individuals from installing charging or price gouge for the privilege of installing even a basic home charger. All that said, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law earmarked around $3.5 billion for charging infrastructure investment in historically disinvested areas, with the NEVI investment, that's the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Investment Formula program, earmarking 40% of money for charges explicitly to be located in disinvested areas. So the question is, what will change with that investment? When we think about disadvantaged communities, communities that historically haven't gotten the investments that they deserve because of economic status or because of their place on the adoption curve of a particular technology or something else, it's so important for the governments who serve all people um, and us who, you know, we have this view in our mind that one of the one of the places that we take up in the industry is as one who can break the chicken and the egg problem. Because of our media model, we have a media station that can sell ads, we have chargers that can make money by selling kilowatt hours, we have multiple revenue streams. We have the ability to be flexible in what makes sense for where we invest. So if you look at our network, 40% of our stations are in historically termed disadvantaged communities who tend to not see investments like that. Um, and we just did that on our own because our model made sense. And so this is something that we you know, feel really strongly about. It's a place that we think with our model that we are uniquely positioned to make a difference in these communities. And it's something that every day when we decide where to invest our own money into building stations, you know, making sure that we serve those communities is one of our top priorities. The Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of federal and state policies like it are targeted at EV adoption. It's great. We want to accelerate it. There's historic amounts of money. It's very, very powerful. Um, and the government is aware that there are ways to spend money suboptimally. So you'll see things like the Justice 40 initiative, which really, really makes sure that at least 40% of all you know, government funded projects are going to be serving communities that are historically disadvantaged. Um, and that's really important. And obviously our technology and our business model is something that really jives well with that type of mentality. So that's something that we applaud and we think, um, you know, we're really excited to see that type of 
um, direction from these very large programs to say, hey, let's make sure that this money is going to communities, to all communities, communities who historically might not have been served, um, who you might not think right away like, um, oh, that'll be a hotbed for EV adoption. These programs are strong. They're in, the, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there is a used car tax credit um, and, and you're seeing other automakers coming out with cheaper and cheaper models. We're getting down the cost curve. There are initiatives to get down there. This is exciting. Therefore, let's make sure those communities have charging too. And that's something that we think we can make a big difference. Disadvantaged communities have certainly historical lack char historically lacked charging infrastructure and, and FreeWire has been committed to ensuring that charging is deployed equitably. Uh, in fact, in California, over 65% of our deployments are in disadvantaged or low-income communities, and, and, and we're proud of that. Um, the other ways that we're, we're strategizing deployment of, of our charging equipment into disadvantaged communities and, and historically underserved communities is, is thinking about the electrification of fleets, especially those where fleets have been a significant source of local air pollution. So bringing our charging infrastructure to a lot of fleets is helping them reduce um, local air pollution, which is which is a benefit to the to the community. We're also looking at applications around multifamily dwellings where there may not be dedicated parking spaces for those residents and uh, the residents could, if they have an EV, could really benefit from being able to access uh, community community charging. The Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law have have really prioritized disadvantaged communities and low income communities very very significantly. For instance, the the NEVI program, the National Electric Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, which is a five billion dollar program to invest in charging infrastructure across the country has committed to dedicate 40% of those funds to areas that have historically been um, disinvested in um, and, and underserved. So that's that's a very significant investment. Those, those laws have also prioritized the electrification of heavily polluting uh, activities, fleets, again, is medium duty, heavy duty fleets, the electrification of, of, of those activities can significantly benefit these communities and ports too. There's a huge push and, and a lot of funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law to help decarbonize at, at ports. And there's also a variety of, of tax incentives out there that will be prioritizing these communities. One in particular is um, a tax credit associated with, with energy storage as it relates to energy communities. And energy communities are, are defined as those that have been historically invested in the, the fossil fuel industry. And so as a way to bring a uh, just transition to those communities and bring more clean energy opportunities to those communities, there's a variety of incentives one of which is, is a tax credit that will uh, help aid that transition. The Inflation Reduction Act has been a very important influence uh, on serving disadvantaged communities. The provision for the 30C tax credit actually supports the economics behind sites that are in those communities. And that allows us to invest much more aggressively to build stations there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true that uh, historically in the charging networks that have been deployed, there has been uh, a bias that's built into the, the deployment of chargers. The way that we uh, make sure that we don't have that at EVgo is by having this network plan that algorithmically decides where the best locations are. And as a part of that, we include the EPA's environmental justice screen. So we're overweighting sites that are serving disadvantaged communities, uh, and especially those that have high pollution effects that cause uh, long-term health problems. So in the future, the way we see our, our network evolving is to grow higher numbers of stalls per sites as the population of electric vehicles increases, and then also to raise the power uh, on the chargers that we are uh, deploying. And then of course, we are building into our network plans very strong service for DEI communities, uh, there, we actually see that about 58% of our future network plan uh, is within a 10-minute drive 
uh, of an EJ area. One of the things that we drive is, you know, what we like to stay at, at stable is that we can provide you with the ROI of an EV charger in just a few clicks. So no more guessing and thinking and analyzing a bunch of data. You put it in an address, we'll give you how much money this thing might make and projected usage rates. Um, if you think about it, it's very similar to what we see in the solar. You know, how did we figure out what the return on investment for a solar panel is? Well, you can draw on a rooftop, a solar panel, and it'll tell you, okay, based on where you're located and the weather, here's how many sunny days you're likely to have. Here's how much of that energy you're going to capture. Here's what you could sell that energy for, what you could offset. And you get a very clear picture of what the return on investment of a site is. And, it, and a big component of that solar thing is the incentives. So there are incentive programs or financing available that will tell you, oh, and, and it can be financed at this rate, or you know, you'll get this tax credit for putting solar on your rooftop, right? So the, the incentive and the, is, is baked into the ROI calculation. We do the same thing. So um, what we can do is for a large portfolio of potential locations, we can quickly tell you which incentives you might be eligible for. Um, this could be because it's in a disadvantaged community. This could be that because it's in a, a highway corridor sponsored by the NEVI program. But the way that our software works is that we'll automatically do the complicated eligibility detection for you. Imagine if you had, think, think about the NEVI program, this alternative fuel corridors. Um, they have a requirement in most of those corridors that you need to be one mile driving distance away from these corridors. But it's, it's one mile driving distance. It's not just as the crow flies. And so you have to put each one of, if you have 2000 sites to analyze and figure out which one of these qualifies for NEVI, put each one of those into Google Maps do a driving distance calculation, write it in a spreadsheet and whittle it down. It's not very easy to figure out which one of these qualify for the incentives. And it makes the work of figuring out what the, you know, which is the best site much harder. Now for thousands of sites, you have to figure out which ones qualify for incentives of those ones that qualify for incentives, which also get good enough utilization rates where the incentives plus the utilization rates leads to a positive ROI for me. So um, to your question on, how is our company looking to improve equity? The, we do it by exposing incentives and rebates into our software and making it a part of the ROI equation in just a few clicks. I mean, we see it already directly. We have customers today who are optimizing for charging stations that go in disadvantaged communities and that go in, you know, these highway corridors that have been, you know, sort of sort of sanctioned in a sense that. You know, they've been said, you know, these are places that we want to put charging infrastructure and every charging network will have some combination of high performing sites and low performing sites, right? Uh, sometimes you just want to have enough coverage and you want to make sure you have a charger on this corridor, but only if you have other sites that are going to help pay for the lack of usage on that one or are going to help uh, or an incentive that's going to help there. So what we see is that actually this will drive, um, it is already driving and pushing our customers to deploy in areas where they may not have done it um, before um, because the incentive programs are switching that ROI equation from red to green um, in what would have always been a red equation. So um, I think it's a great thing. I think of course there's arguments on exactly how you should determine what are disinvested communities I, but you know, how many do we need for this in rest communities? Does this truly solve their problem? Do we need home charging as well? Do we need level two charging? You know, there's all sorts of, um, a lot of chatter out there right now, but I think that the core of the idea, the broad stroke here is very good, which is, um, it is moving the economic equation in the favor of these communities. We could surely do better, but it's certainly better than nothing. And we should be happy of that and look to the next thing and, and see what we can do to further incentivize that deployment effort. So it looks like we are, maybe, going to see some progress on getting more equitable charging infrastructure rolled out. Infrastructure that will help folks who will most likely be the ones who will benefit the most from electrification and being able to use electric vehicles with their lower total cost of ownership. But there's one final important piece and that's how the community is involved. We've seen plenty of anecdotal evidence that chargers have been located in inappropriate locations or poorly sighted. I have a level two charger near me at a cinema with a two hour limit on charging. There have not been that many films I've seen in the past few years, which including the trailers and getting overpriced popcorn come in at under two hours. So all in all, it's not very useful. 
We've heard of rapid chargers being in communities where income is low, which is great. But the charger is placed in a parking lot that has incredibly high parking fees tacked on in addition to the charging cost. Or there are level two chargers positioned in a parking lot that has a reputation for vandalism. And the chargers are in the furthest, most dark and dingy corners of the lot. So it matters whether and how communities are involved in that charger placement. Community stakeholders are typically involved in our projects through our customers. So our customers increasingly have a commitment to environmental, social, and governance objectives and, and goals associated with their commitment and, and aspirations to reduce greenhouse gases. And typically, our customers are working with their communities to uh, advertise the charging that they offer and um, make them aware of the, of the promise of electrification. For FreeWire specifically, we're working with community stakeholders through our contractors and, and the workforce that we contract with to, to deploy, operate, and maintain our stations. So increasingly here in the United States, there's, there's a, a priority, prioritization given to workforce training and, and being able to employ uh, local, local workers throughout the country, especially you know, those in, in disadvantaged or, or low-income communities. A lot of the recent funding has prioritized this and it gives FreeWire a great opportunity to build partnerships in the community to ensure that job creation is, is happening where these projects are being deployed. When we think about where we're locating our stations, community is a big part of our decision-making. It's important to us that when we put our stations in the ground that it's actually serving a community who's going to use it. That's important for us. But we're a really impact-driven company, so we care that this matters to them and it's something that's going to make a difference. So part of that is just done through data-driven, right? We, we, we're, we're a big company. We're doing lots of stations. We do need data. And so we, we lean a lot on our data collection, our predictive modeling um, that really helps us look at where the most beneficial place to put stations is for a community and how they, we expect them to use them. Um, oftentimes we're working with people who are staples in the community, right? So we're working with the grocery store or at least one of the grocery stores that tends to have a relationship with their community and they care a lot about that. That's something that they talk about with us, that they want to make sure they're putting in charging stations to serve the people um, who are coming in every week to shop at their stores. So those are the main ways that we connect to our communities. I think if you pull back and take a broader look at things, um, there's a lot of initiatives that are going on right now directly trying to serve the community. Um, but how do you do that when you're looking at federal or state level programs. And so that's where I think, you know, our internal tool that we use to make good data driven decisions about where to put stations, that tool can then help these governments who are thinking about where to spend their money, thinking about where they need to put in charging so it'll be effective and also serve everyone in their community and not just parts of their community. That type of data is really important. We've seen a huge increase in demand from cities, mayors, governors, departments of transportation. Everyone is trying to make sure that the initiatives they're putting into place are making sense, are good investments, and are serving their people. And so I think that tool and taking our tool and having governments use it to make good decisions, that's another way that we feel like we're, we're doing a service to, to do the best thing possible for the communities. You know, this is something I'm not as familiar familiar with in terms of what you know what community level drivers there are. Um, you can see we have a very sort of capitalism is sort of a bad word I feel like these days, but we have a very capitalistic approach to helping these companies, which is you need to make money um, in driving incentives, um, in driving um, uh, special credit system, the rebates for charging station deployment in places like disadvantaged communities to incentivize deployment in those areas. Because if, if you think about it, you know, these companies are do to some degree have to act as rational economic actors, right? They're, they don't wanna lose money on a site and, and they're already losing money on most sites. They gotta fix it. Their, their company's life is at stake. And, and so to go in a disadvantaged community where for example, our software might say that your utilization here potential is quite low 
um, we, we don't think you're gonna get that much usage here in the next few years. Um, to go into that community and do that is, is a really tough proposition. So I think the role of community that I've seen, you know, sort of for, not on the ground, but I've seen play is in to drive the ROI equation into the green for those communities by introducing incentives and rebates where it may not be economically viable to deploy a charging station today. Now, if charging companies were making a ton of money and we're doing really, really well, then yeah, maybe there should be some laws and regulations. You have to put at least this many chargers here and you have to, you're making so much money. You're like, there's no reason you can't do this. But we have to understand that most are losing money. So they're not, they're, they're doing the most rational thing, which is to fight for the survival of their, themselves. And that survival mentality needs to shift. And the way that we do that is with government involvement, incentives, rebates, and creation. Uh, we involve community stakeholders through a variety of different mechanisms, uh, including our, our website, which uh, has a portal where you can provide inputs on places where you think chargers ought to be located. Uh, we have a very active community of EV drivers out there, and everybody has ideas, it seems, uh, on where best to place chargers. So we get uh, many inputs that way. We get them through our app. We get them through our call center. Uh, and we, we take those inputs quite seriously and, uh, and we use them as a mechanism to help us decide where locations are. Expanding access to charging is a good thing, but we need to keep the pressure on to make charging more accessible at home, in commercial areas, at people's workplaces. If these policies work the way they're intended and charging providers actually do the work that they've promised, then we should see significant progress. But we can't let them backslide. And we also need to keep pushing for a wider rollout of level two charging. ABC, always be charging, as they say. And that can only happen if we make sure that chargers are available for everyone, everywhere. And on that note, we're done with today's video. If you have comments, Drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, you can put them in the comments there. You can also pop them down below. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and our swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is the amazing list of charged up supporters and shout outs go to our V2G Patreon supporters. Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Shauna Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Asenta, Denny Hyde, Lance Schaal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, My Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin and, of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, keep evolving!